Good evening, and welcome to the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, and to the seventh season of the Artisan Lecture Series. I'm Karen Taylor, Program Director for the General Society. This program is supported in part by public funds from New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and the Friends of the Artisan Lecture Series. The General Society was founded in 1785, 232 years ago, by the skilled craftsmen of New York City, artisans who represented 22 different trades. These included carpenters, saddlers, tailors, and silversmiths, among many others. Today, our organization continues to serve the people of the city of New York through our educational and cultural programs, including our tuition-free Mechanics Institute, our Lock Museum, which is upstairs, uh, the John M. Mossman Lock Collection, the General Society Library, which of course you're in this evening, and our nearly 200 century old lecture series of which tonight's lecture is part of. You will find additional information on the General Society on a blue and white postcard on your seat. And if you're interested in library membership, you will find information on the front registration desk. This artisan lecture series is co-curated by Rhett Butler, owner and founder of E.R. Butler and Jean Wiart, master artisan of fine ornamental metalwork, and who, who is also the original creator of this artisan lecture series. Tonight, we gather once more to pay tribute to the arts of craftsmanship. The Artisan Lecture Series has committed itself to giving voice to internationally known artisans who will talk about the intricacies of their specialized crafts. The mission of the Artisan Lecture Series is to promote the work and art of skills craftsmen to insist in ensuring that their unique knowledge is understood and carried forth for future generations. Our speaker this evening, who absolutely embraces all, this, all these traditions, is Chris Pelletieri, uh, who specializes in free hand sculpture, decorative design, architectural ornamental work, portraiture, and lettering. He's both a skilled craftsman and an exceptional artist, using both areas of expertise to shape stone distinctively. His training began over 20 years ago at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in a stone masonry apprenticeship program which profoundly impacted his life and work. He was one of the last to be trained before the stone yard closed in 1995, and he stayed on as artisan residence at the cathedral doing prestigious commissions for the institutions and individuals. Two years ago, he established a non-profit organization, Pelletieri's Stone Carvers Academy, whose mission is to give exposure to the activity of stone carving and to provide training in the traditional methods. And I'm sure that Chris will elaborate on this during his talk. It is now my huge pleasure to introduce to you Chris Pelletieri. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here. I have never presented a lecture before. Um, we all have a story, and I'm sure that my story is not, probably not the most fascinating of all the people gathered here tonight. And I'm definitely not the most uh, gifted public speaker. So what gives me the right to present to you tonight um, is because of a decision that I made about 30 years ago to become a craftsman and to dedicate myself to stone carving and the decision that I make every day to continue to do that and sometimes it's not an easy decision to make um, because sometimes it's contrary to my sense of responsibility to take care of my family and 
Sadly, my wife's not here right now, but uh, I wanted her to know that her support is absolutely essential to my being able to do what I do and to continue to be a craftsman. So now let's wind back the clock and take a journey backwards through time to uh, the beginning of my story. Oh, sorry, that's a little too far. That's me at age five minutes. I put these next few pictures in because New York has changed a lot and uh, this give you sort of the flavor of what, uh, what things were like then. Um, some things for the better, some things worse, but uh, definitely different. Now this is me and my brother Carlo at about um, a year later after I was born. And um, so I thought now to tell you a little bit about my family. A lot of people ask, well, your father must be a stone carver. Do you, did you learn, you know, pick up the family trade? And uh, that's not quite the way it happened. My, my dad, um, he had a not great relationship with hand tools. When he would go to hang a picture, use hammers and nails, sometimes I'd hear frustration and cursing. He was very competent as a photographer. In fact, this is his work on the screen. And my mom was very competent in her activities too, but not necessarily hand tools. So um, this shows uh, me and my brother with our Uncle Peter. And I would say that my, uh, the time I spent with him was my int introduction to the magic of working with uh, tools and materials. He was a sculptor and a glass blower, and uh, he drew, he did carpentry, he did welding. He did a great many things with tools, and I used to love to spend time in his workshop, and it just seemed like he would grab a tool off the bench and saw through a piece of wood, and maybe later I would you know, try to do the same thing myself and just get nowhere. And he might as well have been using a magic wand and throwing ingredients into a cauldron and just casting a spell because to me it was just magical. And I didn't realize it at the time, but later on I realized the profound impact that that had on me. So uh, moving forward a little bit, my mom and dad, uh, they settled in, in uh, the Upper West Side of Manhattan, very close to the cathedral, so the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. So when it came time for my brother and I to go to school, they put us into the cathedral school. And this is a picture of, of well, we're both in this picture. Um, that's me. I don't know where Carlo is. <laughs> Somewhere around here. <laughs> but um, we spent a lot of time in the choir stalls of the cathedral, staring around at the architecture, hours and hours. And I think that also had a profound impact on me, although I didn't necessarily realize it at the time. Here's me, uh, you know, doing my solo, I guess, whatever. I, uh, I was in about the seventh grade at the cathedral when Dean Morton uh, came up with a big idea. Dean James Parks Morton, he initiated uh, or reinitiated construction on the cathedral because they had, they had taken a break of about 35 years and they hadn't done any construction. And um, here he is. Uh, it's a huge undertaking because in the 35 years that they had stopped building, the entire stone carving industry in New York City and I'm sure elsewhere had completely withered. All of the workshops and, and uh, businesses and individuals who created these amazing works in our city, the, uh, Bethesda Terrace and, um, well, even buildings that don't really have the kind of uh, fame of Bethesda Terrace, had beautiful sculpture and, and workshops that, where people were being trained to do these things, not so much uh, self-taught, you know, geniuses, but people who were learning from people who learned, from people who learned from just generations of craftsmen who pass their skills down to others. And that is the kind of system of training 
which is really needed to uh, accomplish the decoration of a facade or you know really large-scale things you need uh, a system like that so the Dean uh, decided to try to start that kind of training again and here are some pictures before I got involved of some of the individuals who later on would teach me and uh, what he had to do was to go to uh, England and import some master carvers and master stonemasons from England to train people from the neighborhood. And now we'll uh, circle back to my story because after I graduated from cathedral school that went through eighth grade, I, uh, I went to high school at Stuyvesant High School. I was a good student, I worked hard, but honestly, uh, it was very hard and they, they pushed, they gave us a little too much work, I'd say at Stuyvesant, a little too much homework and I was beginning to get a little burned out about the sedentary, information-based uh, memorization of facts. But I didn't know what else to do. That's just, that seemed to be all that there was out there. And I continued, of course, everybody went on to college that I, that I knew, and I continued to NYU. And by this time, I was really getting uh, pretty burned out on everything that I was being exposed to and really hungry for something different. And I was beginning to visualize my future after graduation with increasing pessimism, increasing feeling of, wow, I hope I can do something that doesn't have anything to do with what I'm doing in school. <laughs> and that brought me to the point of uh, 1989, which I guess you could see as sort of a crossroads time because I graduated from college. I had no intention of going to graduate school. Basically, I graduated with a degree in math, which didn't qualify me to do anything the advisors told me uh, other than to be an actuary or to be a math teacher. And I had no d uh, interest in doing either of those things. So I was kind of unsure of what I was gonna do. Interesting time for me. And that's when I met Amy, my wife. So a lot of good things were happening. And one other good thing that was happening was I did some construction, I worked in uh, just to earn some money and to kill time. I, I did some interior renovation work and I discovered how much I liked working with tools and how much I liked working with materials and making things. But I was aware as I was doing this that there was such limitation to the modern construction me methods that I was being exposed to in the sense that the whole mentality of the construction industry seemed to be to enable people to, do, to be productive with a minimum amount of training by dumbing the work down and making it as simple as possible and get the work done as quickly as possible, which isn't against the law. I think that makes sense from an economic standpoint, but it wasn't what I was really interested in doing. So my mind went back to what I had seen at the cathedral when I was in seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, and I began to think of that as that might be a really good direction for me to go in. So luckily, my mom worked at the cathedral school and had a weekly meeting with all the other heads of the departments at the cathedral and she was able to use her connections and I was persistent and I was lucky and they finally gave me a chance to try it. And this is me uh, probably in the first six months of my uh, apprenticeship working on stone masonry. Stone masonry is the branch of stone shaping, which focuses on geometric shapes, uh, building stones, stones for construction. It involves no judgment whatsoever. It involves uh, being accurate and being able to create the shapes that the architects and the, uh, the people who make the decisions about the cathedral wanted to have made because obviously someone else is creating the stone which would go on top of this and if people don't do their work very precisely things won't, won't work out very well so it was not sculpture by any means but it was a very excellent way of learning how to use the tools and how to do work um, accurately and efficiently and as soon as I started doing this I really fell in love with it and I knew that I wanted to continue as long as possible and it seemed like there wouldn't be any problem with that because the cathedral, if anybody isn't aware, 
is only about half, well, maybe two-thirds finished, but there's an enormous amount of work still to be done, and they just seem to be gearing up and expanding, and it seemed like this work was going to go on about as long as I wanted to be doing it. Here's a few more pictures of me during that time period. Very happy period of my life. And this picture will help acquaint you a little bit better with what I mean by stonemasonry because if you want to make a cylinder in stone precisely and you're starting out with a rough block like this, the first thing you have to do is create a surface, uh, a flat, true surface on top, square uh, an edge down, and create another flat surface, you know, underneath, which is hidden in this diagram. Then you have to draw your circle uh, at the top and a corresponding circle at the bottom. And then you have to turn it sideways like that and do a whole bunch of what they call chamfers, which are these facets. So, um, especially in the old days, before saws, before any kind of uh, machinery, that was really a challenging way of, of <laughs> a challenging work. And, and that's a very, a cylinder is a very simple uh, comparatively geometric shape to make if you think about domes and if you think about rib vaulting or, or even a handrail for a sort of a spiral stairs which is a helical shape and a cylindrical shape. There are no flat surfaces on it at all. So that's just to give you an idea of the challenges of stone masonry. This is me with one of my best teachers, José. He, he was brought over from France uh, or he came from... Oh, <laughs> He came willingly from France. <laughs> um, and he, he taught me so much. And even though I think the piece of stone that I'm standing with there was beyond my level, he was doing one on the other side because it was a pair that went on either side of a gable. And he walked me through the whole process. And he's the reason, and some of the other people are, are the reasons why uh, I progressed as far as I did in, in only two years at the Stone Yard because they were investing in robotic machinery, some uh, automated stone shaping equipment, which radically uh, changed the, the feeling of the place and also the, the actual work that I was doing. And it made me lo no longer um, very excited about the job. And after having been introduced to this thing, which was I was very passionate about, I still am very passionate about, to see the prospects get less that I would be able to continue was more than I could stand. So um, I was not aware that they would be closing within three or four years, but I quit anyway because it seemed like the end of my dream at the cathedral. So this brings me to the second sort of moment of crisis <laughs> where I was, I had discovered something that I really, really wanted to do that gave me so much joy. But not working at the cathedral, there were no other cathedrals in the neighborhood where they were looking for help. There were no other stone shaping industry of any kind that I was aware of. So I was kind of in a difficult position of not knowing exactly, knowing what I wanted to do, but not knowing exactly how I was going to do it or how I was going to connect with people, if there were any, who wanted that kind of work. So uh, I, I was very lucky at that time that I put a piece of my uh, sculpture in the waiting room of a chiropractor where I was receiving treatment for uh, lower back problems as a barter. And somebody uh, who was another patient in his office happened to see the work. And that gentleman happened to be the uh, manager of a building on Fifth Avenue and 82nd Street, directly across from the Metropolitan Museum, which was still in the hands of the same family who had built it, uh, had it built, or the Duke Siemens uh, building. Now it's owned by Carlos Slim, uh, the wealthiest man in the world, I'm told. But at that time, they were doing a complete renovation of the interior. They needed uh, fireplace mantles. They needed stairway handrails. And fortunately, the gentleman who um, 
brought me on board was a very outside the box thinker. He wasn't someone who went to the internet or to other sources to look for the help that he'd need to get the things done. He, he went to his chiropractor's waiting room to find the kind of work that he needed to have done. So the first thing I did was to uh, help them restore this uh, fountain. Somebody had walked up into the shells to change a light bulb and they had uh, been destroyed. So lucky for me, I was able to uh, repair that. And I did that in the first uh, workshop I had outside the cathedral, which was in uh, Williamsburg, Brooklyn. I was just renting it on a per month basis. But then he said, why don't you come to the building to do your work now? Why don't you move into 1009 Fifth Avenue, not to live, but to use our space for the work? And that's what I did. This shows me working in the, I don't know, I guess it was sort of the foyer which was under construction. And you can see clearly the uh, impact of the geometric uh, training I'd had at the cathedral. I was carving a, a marble, a replica of a marble column from the 12th century uh, Roman um, culture. This is me with the finished product. The first thing that I did for the Siemens, how, uh, I think, 23, 24? I was about 23 years old at, at, in this picture. But I look basically the same, I would say. <laughs> um, this was the first original project that I did for the, the Siemens family. Actually, I didn't really do it for the Siemens family. This was part of that moment in uh, 1991 when I was like, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna continue? And I went to Pittsburgh to meet a gentleman who was working for the Cathedral uh, Stoneworks, but he was doing an outside job at Carnegie Mellon University, and I asked him for advice. And he said, make a fireplace mantle, because that's probably the most in-demand item that a stone carver could possibly make, and it will help you to display your talents and your abilities. Use colored stone. Don't use Indiana limestone, because it's not that exciting uh, color material. So... So I followed his advice because I wanted so badly to uh, make something of myself. And I think what I'd like to bring out in this slide is I, from the beginning of my self-employment career, I made every attempt to challenge myself with every project that I, was a, that I had any control over. Uh, and this was totally my control because it was speculation. I, I didn't have a customer. Later on, I sold it to the, the Siemens family. But you see the molding, it curves as it comes around the corner. It curves in the uh, elevation, but it also curves out in the plan. So it's kind of a complicated uh, geometrical challenge. And for the carving, I had never carved anything like oak leaves in my experience at the cathedral. The cathedral trained me up to very rigorously in the stone masonry, but it didn't give the, I didn't receive that much training, maybe a couple of weeks in crockets, which is a Gothic ornament of a stylized leaf, but I hadn't done anything like these oak leaves. And the oak leaves, as they ascend up the, they, they transform into little creatures. And, and in, when they come to the center, the, the creatures have a fight in the middle. And I, I have a little man and woman in the corners there. So uh, this was my first big self-designed uh, piece of work. And of course I thought, as soon as this gets in somebody's living room and they have a party, everybody's going to be, my phone will be ringing off the hook and I won't be able to get a moment's rest because I'll have so much demand for my work. This was another uh, mantle that I made for the Siemens family. And you see again how I went back to the geometrical uh, training that I had, which I love, to do these uh, spiraling columns and columns with these little Petals, I guess. Uh, anyway, that, that, that's my real um, foundation skill. I also added this mosaic in back, but I had no training in mosaic, so uh, it's pretty self-taught in that way. But I'm proud of it. I think it came out pretty well. And this, uh, this fireplace that I made for them, it features uh, supports for a shelf which gave me my first opportunity to do a uh, carving sculpture by the pointing method. And the pointing method is a way of 
creating sculpture based on a model. I made a clay model of the, mm, the supports on the right and the left, and I cast it in plaster, and I had an excellent teacher named Giancarlo Biaggi, who wasn't running a school exactly, but he was offering informal sort of uh, training in his studio, uh, and he showed me how to use this very precise measuring instrument to copy the plaster model into stone. So all the creativity in this process goes into the making of the model. In the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries, some of the most famous sculptors of that time never carved stone, but they signed their works in marble, just as they would have signed them in, in, in bronze, because they relied on very highly trained um, artisans and technicians who were really good at this duplication method, the pointing method. Uh, this is a stairway railing that I made for the Siemens family. Oh, and at this point, I couldn't work in their building anymore. The project was getting too big, so I moved back to the cathedral because the stone yard, the whole stone business had gone belly up. They didn't have any more funding to do the work that they were doing, so the, it was vacant. And I was able to go back and talk to the priests and the people in charge, and they said, okay, you can use that space for, a, for this job, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. But we were looking for someone to develop that site, so don't expect that it's going to last that long. This piece uh, is in the home of, of, uh, one, of one of our uh, audience members. It, it depicts, well, it, it's also one of my first original sculpture pieces, and it, the two supports depict two different approaches to creativity. The, uh, they're musicians. They're blowing these weird little horns, but the horn blower on the right, he's using, you know, he's, he's reading his music from the book, and the other one on the left, he's more impro improvising and relying on inspiration. So those are two different approaches, analogous to direct carving, which is carving directly in the stone without a model, and the method I just described, which is a pointing method. This is a, a decorative foliage relief, which I made during this early period when I was back at the cathedral as an artist in residence. This is a, the Spirit of St. Louis Monument, which is in Westbury, Long Island. Uh, it marks the spot where Charles Lindbergh took off on his historic flight. And again, after I created this, I was very confident that people would see it and become very excited about the possibilities of using me to create uh, historical monuments and other types of important public sculpture. And I also decided at this point to dip my toe into the world of uh, fine art sculpture and creating uh, original works that could be displayed in galleries and ultimately, hopefully, purchased for people for their gardens and interiors. This is my first uh, such attempt. I, was, I had a, um, a contact with a, a gallery owner who encouraged me to create something for a, a group show. She had no idea how much time I was going to invest in it and how large it was going to become. I would say it's about four feet tall, very, very heavy. And it represents a moment in a story which I had read in the New, York magazine, New Yorker magazine where uh, a gentleman whose son had been born with serious brain uh, development problems hadn't learned to speak. Uh, he was about nine years old and still hadn't uttered a word. But his parents tried various ways to help him develop uh, that part of his brain. And one of them was playing a record with bird songs on it. And the bird calls would come on the record. And then an announcer would say the name of the bird that had just spoken. And that was what the record was. So one day they were walking through the forest. And uh, a bird sang in the tree. And for the first time, the father heard the son speak at the age of nine. And that was, to me, uh, an inspiring moment. And I decided to try to capture that moment in a sculpture. And basically, I think this will show you a lot about what my values are as, a, as an artist. I really like figurative sculpture. 
I really like narrative sculpture, sculpture that tells a story, sculpture that gives you a feeling like obviously you wouldn't know that story just by looking at this sculpture without my explanation, but you can tell that there's something dramatic happening. And I think that comes from my work at the cathedral and my love for the Gothic sculpture, which was basically all illustrating moments from the Bible. My next uh, creation was uh, something I collaborated on with my wife. <laughs> That's Noah Pelletieri, who was not here yet because he dropped his phone down the sewer about half a block from here. And that, he's still there, he's still there trying to get help, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, also very proud of my family. And uh, shortly after he was born, I got an opportunity to create a fountain for the backyard of a family on the Upper East Side. And they just said, we want a wall fountain. We want a Neptune face in the middle. And you can just decide what the rest of it, it was going to be. I have to say that clients like that, they get the best deal out of me because I always want to put as much beauty and my, I want to put the most of my energy into a project which has that kind of open-ended uh, definition. So I didn't just do the faces, I also did all the architectural uh, carving and the capitals and the cornice and even the rock-faced uh, trough where the water is at the bottom. Here's a nice turtle that I made and a beautiful uh, garden sculpture which has the ability to spout water from the middle but it wasn't spouting at the moment when we took this picture. This is direct carving I didn't make a model of this. Um, and then my wife and I collaborated again. <laughs> That's Louisa, who's actually about to enter the auditorium. <laughs> um, I had another opportunity to create a sculpture for the uh, holiday auction of the uh, Institute of Classical Architecture, which is, also has their offices in this building. Um, I would like to, s this is in the window, actually, out on 44th Street as a way of publicizing this, uh, this presentation. I hope you take a look at it w when you leave here. I'm very proud of it. Nobody bid on it, so I got to keep it. And I'm glad because I would prefer to have it to keep rather than if somebody would have bid $100 and taken it home. That would have been probably a lot worse than being able to keep it. But I want to tell you a little bit about it because you have the opportunity to look at it afterwards. I'm inspired by these uh, Chinese rocks called uh, scholar stones. They're natural stones that have been buried in the soil and the acid or some, I don't know why, the, they're eroded under the ground. I'm sure there's some that are totally boring and they throw them away, but the ones that they keep are notable because like when you look at a cloud in the sky, you can look at these scholars' rocks and feel inspired and you can say, ah, oh, I, see, I see this in it, I see that in it. So I went to the Metropolitan Museum, as I do often, and I, I, like, I like to look at these scholars' rocks when I need an idea for an original sculpture. Without feeling I, like I ripped someone off, I, I, I ripped off nature. You know, I, I, saw a, 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 I saw something in this stone and it inspired me. I saw a person who was feeling spent, who was feeling kind of depressed. And uh, the, his best friend, his dog, was trying to console him. And he was just so out of it that he couldn't even really acknowledge the dog's attention. And like most of us, I've been in the position of the man, and I've been in the position of the dog. And that's another thing that I like to bring out about my original sculpture is I like to represent feelings that I've felt that seem important to me and that I think most people can relate to and I like it to be accessible. I want it to look beautiful even if people can't 100% understand what it represents. Uh, this is a, a cemetery headstone that I made. Uh, to show another side of my capabilities. An inscription is something that I had about 
an hour and a half of training at the cathedral, but then I just continued to hone my own skills and, and learn to do the best job I could. And being a stone carver, I forgot to mention this earlier, but maybe some of you are wondering, well, what's the big deal? Uh, what is it about stone carving that you're so excited about? Probably, uh, as I started at the cathedral, some of the things that I discovered about stone carving, which were so, so exciting to me, I had never really spent more than a few, maybe nine or ten hours on any given project, you know, as a school term paper or something, maybe, maybe 15 hours over a, a few weeks. I was finding myself at the cathedral spending eight-hour days, sometimes three weeks of eight-hour days on a single stone. And I think to be able to put so much of your energy into a single project, I'm sure a lot of you understand, but outside this room, maybe not, because there's a lot of valuable jobs, a lot of worthwhile things that don't give you that satisfaction. But for me, that was a really great thing about stone carving. And just re relating to the next slide, it was also great to have access to some great buildings of New York City to do, you know, to work in as if it was home. You know, I worked in the Temple Emmanuel, which gave me great pride. I worked in the Cathedral, St. Thomas Church, and other uh, exciting and notable buildings. And I was, I'd walk right up to a wall with my hammer and chisel, and I'd inscribe letters into the wall. And that just gave me a feeling of pride and, well, a lot of other things I did gave me a feeling of pride too, but sometimes having access to those landmark buildings was really, really fun. Is really fun. It's not a past tense thing. So here's another interesting sculpture I made for someone's garden. She asked me to do a, a, a pair of food dogs, and I didn't really know what that meant, but I did my research and I found out, and she said, don't be slavish, don't make it like something out of a catalog, make it your own. So that was, that was a great thing for a client to say to me. And here is a nice uh, window surround with Renaissance type uh, decorative acanthus leaf decoration. This is a, a fountain in the biblical garden of the cathedral that I'm very proud of because uh, it has a lot of interesting geometry. Um, and here's a, a a cemetery monument for um, actually Mrs. Siemens, my first uh, big client, patron, uh, commission, person who commissioned me to do something. And when it became the turn of the millennium, I created this, uh, this sculpture for the cathedral in what they call the historical parapet. And there's a funny story behind it because when my brother and I were in the choir, we'd stand very close to this uh, parapet and we would have sometimes have processions and we'd walk by it. Uh, like on Easter, they'd have big grand processions. And uh, I noticed that there was a piece of uncarved stone down below on the step here and that this niche was empty. And I never gave it much thought because so many things were unfinished at the cathedral, it didn't seem that weird. But many years later, I discovered that this parapet has a series of niches that have heroes of all the first 20 centuries of, uh, you know, A.D. Uh, there's, there's Abraham Lincoln for the 19th century and George Washington for the 18th century and William Shakespeare for the 17th century and, and on and on back to the first century. But since they did it in 1920, they didn't know what to do for the 20th century. They just left a piece of material on the step waiting to be done. And that's what I was walking by in those processions. And fortunately, in uh, 1999, they asked me to uh, carve. I didn't choose the uh, heroes, but they asked me to be the one to figure out a way to squeeze four uh, figures into the space that held only one on all the other uh, niches which was a, a challenge, and it was a lot of fun, and I'm proud of it. And here's another uh, of my favorite things that I've done. It's a green man, 
and it's on a wall in a garden in uh, Connecticut. And it just gave me the opportunity to do something which is traditional, but also to put my own uh, stamp on it. Here's a, one of its friends. And um, probably my biggest, mm, well, my most prestigious commission, I would say, was uh, a gateway for Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. I did it under the supervision of uh, Robert A. M. Stern Architecture Firm. And um, I was also very confident that once people got to see it, certainly those within the firm, if I hit a home run for them, that they, they would recognize the value and, and be back for more. And this is me working on it in, in the shed at the cathedral. And just to give you a sense of what, what it was like working in that shed by myself, because I had been part of a, a team in that shed when I was first learning. But this, this uh, shot gives you a sense of what it was like, because that's me there. I had a 10-ton crane, which I could just push a button and raise any of these blocks without any effort. It was not crowded. There's, no spa there's nothing at all back there. It was a very unique and uh, amazing opportunity for me. And I'll show you uh, a few months after this picture was taken, this was the situation at that site. But um, it's no, uh, I have no, no anger or bitterness or uh, frustration towards the cathedral because they needed to do what they did just to keep their doors open and keep the heat. Oh, they built an apartment building there. They didn't just tear, the, tear down the building for nothing. They, they uh, built an apartment building to help generate income to keep the cathedral uh, stable. So this brings us to 2014. I had lost my workspace. The uh, firm of Robert A. M. Stern was not ringing my phone off the hook to do more work. In fact, nobody was, um, except Glenn Adamson from the Museum of Arts and Design. He uh, requested that I made a sculpture for um, an exhibition entitled the Makers Open, the top makers of New York City. I said, I have no workspace. He said, oh, it's okay, we'll, we'll clear you some space in, uh, in the building and you can work in, on, in public view. You won't, you won't have to answer questions. We'll have a glass in work area and you can do your thing there. And that was a wonderful opportunity too. Uh, it's inspired by the Roman god Janus uh, so it's a single head with two faces, and instead of hair on the top, there is a New York City skyline. I made this building to look like the mad building, thinking maybe they'd buy it for the collection, but it didn't work. <laughs> Another aspect to this piece is I have dreams, not that often, but every once in a while where I'm flying, and I fly through uh, the city. And I just thought I'd throw that in because I'd always wanted to do an image of a person flying through the city. This is one of the faces. Oh, I almost forgot. The two faces are meant to represent the two extremes of, of wealth and poverty in the city because that's a huge feature of our city. Uh, I'm not saying it's good or bad, but you know how you can walk one or two blocks and move from an extremely prosperous neighborhood to a, a very poor neighborhood. And uh, that's, that's, that's pretty interesting. So I, I, I represented that. Although it's hard to represent wealth or poverty just in a face, uh, most people got it flipped. They didn't, they didn't know which was which. I had the opportunity to do a real New York City stoop, which was wonderful because as I showed you before, there's so much excellent work on the streets and facades, interiors of New York City, from when the stone industry was really juiced up and there were so many talented people and skills and training enabling people to actually do this kind of thing very cheaply, I guess, I don't know. But I, it must have been much cheaper than it is today because even a humble building took advantage of stone carvers to decorate their facades. And this family was unique in that the stoop had been taken away in the 1950s. Did you get your phone back? No. Oh. Sorry. 
We'll take up a collection later for Noah's phone. <laughs> anyway, um, this family had, they bought a building whose stoop had been removed because I guess they wanted the entrance to be at street level, as many people do, rather than having to climb stairs to get to the main uh, foyer. And they wanted to restore it to the way it had originally been. But you know, the brownstone material was so much uh, in demand, mainly because it was local. It was a stone that was quarried close by. And it seems that the supplies of brownstone have been completely exhausted. So the family who commissioned me to do this had to look, had to get the brownstone imported from China. And sadly, it was much harder than the brownstone that they used in uh, native New York. Anyway, I'm very proud to have done something which is a real New York uh, style, architectural, street, decorative piece. And this brings me to uh, my latest passion, which is uh, training. I established uh, a nonprofit with the help of some of my former clients who funded it and helped me do the legal stuff that you need to do to uh, become a, a 501c3 status organization. And the goal is to uh, eventually establish a stone carving center where there would be many, many different types of activities where there would be after school classes for kids, there would be summer programs for high school students, there would be programs for retired people, for autistic, uh, many different populations. And the center, central thing would be uh, a, an ongoing apprenticeship program for four, six, eight individuals to have the same experience that I had when I was trained at the cathedral. Sounds impossible, but we are started and we are, uh, we're doing something to get in that direction. The first program I ran was with four teenagers from the Williamsburg High School of Arts and Design. And they like to send their, uh, they like to send their students on summer internships. So it made my job a little easier because they were already looking for hosts to uh, host their interns. And I was just amazed at how they did, none of them considered themselves artists when they started. They were just like, I want to do something hands-on. And by starting them off with basic things and slowly progressing, it was just incredible what they were able to achieve. And the joy they got out of it was really uh, fulfilling to me. And if you have your uh, phone, you might want to take a picture of this slide because you can see a very excellent video of that program uh, on the computer by going to that link. Um, I hope to, to do more programs. And uh, if anybody is interested in learning more about this program or ways to support the academy, the Pelletier Stone Carvers Academy, I'm going to have my email uh, on the last slide to contact me about that too. If anybody wants to be part of a program, I'm interested in that too. Now, uh, once that program was finished, uh, I didn't have a huge demand for my work, so I decided to work on, I didn't decide, but I was, I was sought after to work on a restoration project, my first ever opportunity to work on a scaffolding which was at the Dakota Apartments on 72nd and Central Park West. And that exposed me to something which people had been asking me, why don't you do restoration, uh, since the very beginning of my self-employment career. And I discovered why I don't want to do restoration. <laughs> <laughs> Working on a scaffolding, I thought, well, they'll probably knock off in November, you know? They'll probably stop when the weather gets cold. No, I think they skipped maybe five or six days the whole winter and sometimes it was in the teens. And it's very hard to uh, do good work when it's that cold. And I'm not complaining. They are a great company. Nicholson Galloway, they're a great company. They do excellent work. All the people I worked with were awesome. But I was used to working at a bench where I could move my work up and down, where I could walk around it. It's very different to work on a building where the work you need to do might be up here or it might be down by your feet. 
You might need to work on your knees. And somebody might need to be holding a vacuum to suck up the dust. And you'll feel like you're working in a telephone booth. It's not comfortable. And one of the big frustrations for me was not being able to work up to my usual standards under those conditions. So this next series of slides shows you another uh, program that the Pelletier Stone Carvers Academy undertook or ran. Um, I was fortunate to be contacted by four individuals just over the course of that year while I was on the scaffolding who they came to me and they said, we want to learn to do what you do. How do we learn? What programs are there out there? And I was like, I'm sorry, I wish I could help you, but I don't know of any programs out there, but I'm trying to run programs, and if you will be so kind as to write me a page of uh, explanation as to why you want to do this, how important it is to you, I will present those letters to some of my funders, and maybe they'll get excited and want to fund a program that you can be part of. And just like that, it happened. You will notice that they're doing some of the same things that the teenagers are doing. That's because I have a very clear vision of the best way to train stone carvers. Uh, it doesn't include, at least not early on, the opportunity to make a masterpiece, which is why so many, well, one shortcoming of other programs is that people are presented with the opportunity to make an expressive, uh, beautiful, complicated sculpture the first time they pick up the tools. And that just doesn't usually come out very well. I like to say it's like trying to learn the Russian language at the same time write beautiful poetry. So you're trying to learn a whole new alphabet, a whole new vocabulary, a whole new set of grammar, and say something which will move, you know, be moving to people. It's just impossible. You need to learn the grammar and you learn to say, Learn to say very basic things before you try to say really high level things. And I see that I think my slides are almost over and I'd like to just give you a chance to uh, capture my website and I encourage you please uh, look at, I mean you've seen most of my portfolio but I have a lot of interesting things that I wrote about my philosophy and uh, keep you abreast of things that I do and uh, I'd like to thank my brother-in-law, Erwin, for making that website for me. And here's my email and phone number in case you'd like to contact me. And at this point, I'd like to uh, encourage you to ask me any questions that might occur to you about anything I've said. Yes, sir? Oh, oh wait, sorry, hold on. Oh, do you want to move the microphone or should I? Um, we are recording this, so I'm going to ask if you would mind waiting until the mic arrives before you ask your question, and then we can all hear it. So thank you so much. Thank you. How long did it take you to bake certain things? For example, just for example, like uh, the uh, Spirit of St. Louis. How long did that take, or that backyard? Thing with those several things. How long did those take? It was a long time ago, but I believe it was about six months. And I mean, I did it all by hand. I, 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 I was still in a period where I was wanted to prove myself. Not Nobody was there watching me, but I wanted to prove myself to myself. So I was breaking all the waste by hand, uh, you know, with a hammer. And you can see the tools back on that table. And uh, wheelbarrows full of uh, waste. So I could have done it a lot faster, but that's how long it took, six, about six months. And the fountain, probably closer to 10 months. How long were you in the Doris Duke house? I'm going to say two or three years. Oh, really? Yeah. We got married there. They were very nice to us. Yeah? Um, I see that in, in no picture were you using grinders or pneumatic tools or even pneumatic chisels. Do you use those tools? I do use pneumatic chisels. Uh, when I was at the cathedral and being trained, I saw a lot of immaturity and people who couldn't wait to get their hands on, on power tools. And that kind of made me like, I don't want to be like them. 
but that was kind of immature too because those tools have a lot of uh, potential to not just accelerate your work, but to, uh, some people might not realize it because the pneumatic, ch well, pneumatic, maybe nobody knows what that is, but there, there's a way of carving stone, rather than striking the chisel with a hammer, there's sort of a, pist a, a piston, <laughs> which is uh, powered by compressed air. And it's been around for a long time. It's been around probably for 200, well, 150 years. Uh, so that piston, that the, the, ha the thing inside that strikes the chisel is much lighter than a hammer. It's just that it gives you so many blows per second that it, it cuts gently, but uh, fast because it hits so many times per second. I wasn't burning with desire to get my hands on one because I wanted to learn to, to do a good job with the hand tools first. But now, uh, I embrace it. I hate grinders because they make a lot of dust and they make a lot of noise. Well, the pneumatic makes a lot of noise too. And I like to listen to music when I can, but the grinders I, I, I used all the time on the scaffolding is almost like ubiquitous, to use a nice vocabulary word. Um, but a lot of dust can be bad for your lungs, and it can also be bad for your relationships with your neighbors, because <laughs> nobody wants to have that kind of dust in their workshop. Sure. That? Next question, please. So, um, with St. John the Divine, is there a museum there or any kind of an exhibit or a book of any sort that talks about the history of the, of the design and the building and, the, and particularly the stone work? The, and then, second part of the question is, where are they gonna go? Do we, do we have any future in place at this point for the, for the cathedral? Okay, those are all good questions. Um, they do not have a museum or an exhibit, but they have an archives, which has, and, and I think the archives are available to anybody who makes an appointment to look at them. And they have a lot of sculpture, uh, a, lot of, a lot of photographs of the work that was being done then. They even have videos because the stone yard was on TV and in the press a lot. So you can, you can really learn a lot from those videos. Ben Affleck, when he was like 10 years old, he came and did a PBS show called The Voyage of the Mimi. And you can actually go, you can get that on uh, YouTube. So if you, if you, if you uh, search for the cathedral, the voyage of the Mimi, that's an easy way right from home that you can get a really good uh, introductory glimpse of what the stone yard was like. And people ask me all the time, what's gonna happen at the cathedral? And nobody knows because uh, a lot of it depends on who's in charge. You know, we've seen in our, in our nation what happens when somebody new steps in and takes, I mean, not ultimate control, but when somebody exerts their influence, the things that they're interested in doing will flourish, and the things that they're not interested in doing will be like neglected. So uh, the stone yard only started because Dean Morton was passionate about architecture and training people in traditional techniques, and he was very, he didn't, wasn't afraid of risk. So uh, that's why it happened. And <laughs> some people would say that's why they got into such financial trouble because it was very expensive. But it, like it's a, really depends on who's in charge and, and what their priorities are. Uh, do you make uh, preliminary drawings for your sculptures? And the second question is, what kind of marble do you use? I, I almost always make a drawing before I start. The, the sculpture, the sandstone, the, the red sculpture with the man and the boy and the tree that I went into such detail about, that's probably an exception. I didn't make any drawing except on the surface of the actual block of stone. I don't, when I was a kid, I used to like to draw. I drew a lot, but then I got to a point where I sort of idolized Norman Rockwell and people who could really draw like photorealistic or paint, you know, really, really technically excellent. 
So I, I looked at my own work and I felt like, this is disgusting, I, I, I'm terrible at drawing. And I was embarrassed of it and I, I completely stopped drawing. And even to this day, I don't really enjoy drawing. But I, I obviously recognize the value of drawing and whenever, with the exception of that piece, whenever I set out to make a sculpture, I do it, at least draw it from the front and from the side view. And sometimes I make a clay model, like I was talking about duplicating clay models. Sometimes I do that as well. But um, drawing is very important, and I, I always draw when I make a sculpture now. Um, and the other question was about what type of uh, marble I use. I don't use that much marble. Mostly I use limestone and some sandstone. And when I do use marble, marble is tricky because um, there are some kinds of marble which are totally not suited to, to the kind of sculpture that I want to make. They're, uh, they're very hard, but yet they're kind of crumbly so that the fine details, you can't really do it well. It's harder than limestone, so it, it takes more time. I'm not really an expert in marble. The few things that I've done in marble were in white Carrara marble. Uh, and Limestone is my favorite. Yeah, next question. Well, I wanted to ask you, uh, after this will be 45 years of my self attending the cathedral come September, and uh, my family gave a stone that I like to think maybe oh. you carved, but of the stones that are stacked around the grounds, do you have any in particular that you did that are still there, ready to be put up someday? That's a good question. I, I, uh, I was not fortunate to do very many stones for the cathedral because at the time when I started working there, they were going through a transition between focusing entirely on stones for the cathedral to creating sort of a, a business which would attract clients from all over the world, uh, and some of the money that would be generated from doing these commercial venture would go into the, would fund the construction of the cathedral. So I only did one stone that I, that was for the cathedral. It was an arch stone, and I don't know where it is now. I don't know if it was installed on the tower or if it's one of the ones that's on the ground. Probably it's on the ground because they only set stones for one season after I started working there. They continued doing, most of the work that I did is on the Jewish Museum, which is at Fifth Avenue and uh, 93rd or so. And that was one of the outside jobs that the cathedral got, which was really an outstanding job. It was a very decorated French Gothic style and so many challenges. That's why they brought those French carvers because the people who had been trained at the cathedral to do cathedral work, there were challenges that they didn't know how to deal with. So I was really lucky to be there at that time as far as learning, but not that lucky to be there in terms of helping to contribute to the cathedral. Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering, did you ever contact the local stone union when you were Involved? Did you, did you ever think of going on the outside to do work? Uh, on scaffoldings, like on the exterior yes, well, we restoration? Do, I'm in the union for many years, so that's why I was just curious if you ever made an attempt to contact them. I didn't know because uh, I had some, mm, I was pretty ignorant about what that industry uh, was like, but my uninformed opinion was that the work was not of the technical challenge that was motivating to me. There were already people who were serving the needs of that industry that they wouldn't even really be an easy job to get. And the work I did on the Dakota, which was 25 years later, it, it sort of confirmed a lot of those uh, opinions. Now, I mean, there's a lot of challenging things that were done for that job on the Dakota, but they, 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 they sent out to a firm in Canada to get that work done. Uh, Yale University, under the design of, of Robert Stern, they, they built new, many new buildings for their campus with a lot of, I think, a lot of Gothic ornament, but 
they also used that firm in Canada because it's a big firm and they were able to produce much more volume of work than I could quicker. And uh, so maybe I'm too small for that, but uh, I did not, basically the answer, I did not investigate that option. When well, I, yeah. to, to, to go into it a little further, you're correct that there isn't as much carving. There's very, actually very little of that done. It's all shipped in and speed is what they want. Sure. Production, yeah. like you said, grind, grinders, <laughs> grinders all over the place. Yeah. So, yeah, so you're right, it'll be a little bit different. Yeah. But thanks, thanks for okay. that suggestion. Okay. How are your hands? Oh, my hands are great, but I have problems with my elbow and my shoulder and my knees and my back. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a very good orthopedic surgeon, and he's keeping me uh, together and prolonging my career. And do you know any other stone carvers in the city? Are, is there a network for you? Uh, I know a few others. One of the most uh, impressive ones just decided that it's uh, not something he wants to continue doing because he feels like technology has really made it impossible to compete because technology is just coming up with all kinds of substitutions for human skill, which is understandable, but it's, it's very sad. Uh, one interesting thing, I, I was at Hunter High School today doing a demonstration and a, and, a, and a presentation for the students there. And I did that at Stuyvesant High School as well a few uh, months ago. And they have these robotics clubs where kids learn to, I don't know, I guess they create robots that maybe have compete to do some simple task quickly and, 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 uh, and the, the weird thing about it is, paradoxically, the reasons why a lot of these kids enjoy the robotics club is because they get to use tools and they get to do hands-on things, <laughs> but what they're learning to do is to create machines that deprive other people of the opportunities to do those things. And I, I understand, I, I probably would have been on the robotics club when I was in high school too. But it's never really examined, or, or I'm, well, it probably is, but I'm not aware of it, to, to give thought to, well, is this really, are we taking away something that is valuable? I, I like to compare it to a, a neighbor of mine was leaving our building. He had his, all his biking gear on, all his spandex. He had his 18-speed bike, and he was ready to go off for a ride. And it would be like saying to him, oh, I have my car, I can take you where you want to go, very fast and easily. Well, that's, that's not the point. He's doing it for fun and for exercise and fulfillment. So that's why I do what I do. And it would be silly for somebody to say, well, we have a machine that can do that much faster. You know, you can just sit there, you can set it up and then go relax and come back later and the, the job will be done. The motivation to, to automate is a business, a business motivation. And I, I won't say it should be against the law. Everybody wants to make money and support their family. And, and a lot of times people don't know how to do the stone carving. And they own a stone carving business, so hey, let's get the most up-to-date equipment available. That makes perfect sense to me. But it's also, to me, it's sad that there's this whole activity which goes back thousands of years, which um, is hurt by that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for the exciting stories. I would love to see some of the tools, if you could just like hold up a couple of tools and show this, this is what this one does and so forth. Okay, if you don't sure. Mind. One second. Okay. <laughs> They're on a table back behind the audience. That's a great question because from all my years of, of teaching classes, I have really good metaphors for all the tools and uh, ways of explaining how they work. But we're, we're, we're into, uh, I don't want to go on too long. We're already uh, an hour and five, so I don't want to, I'll do it quickly. So 
I can almost go on autopilot because I've done this so many times. I have a chest full of tools with probably 800 tools in it, but they can almost all be broken down into these three families. You have the punch or the point, which is a, a rod of steel that's sharpened into a pyramid point at the end. That's the punch. You have the claw chisel, which is a, a, a rod of steel that's flattened out into a blade at the end and it's got these teeth shaped into the blade. And you've got a, a regular flat chisel with this blade with no teeth. And you've got to imagine that the block of stone that you start with is your origin point, your point A, and whatever you have in your imagination that you want to bring out is your destination, your point B. And you've got to imagine that these tools are your vehicles. These are the things that are going to take you from point A to point B. And the punch, or the point, is like the airplane because it breaks the biggest pieces of waste the fastest with the least effort, but it's the least precise. So in the same sense that you cannot jump in an airplane and fly it directly to Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco, you have, to take, you have to land a safe distance away and switch to a slower, less, uh, a slower, more precise tool, which is the tooth chisel or the claw. That's like the bus to get from the airport to the neighborhood where you're going to eventually relax. It's a slower tool. It's not a tool that you use to take away big waste, despite the way it looks. Oh, it's like a savage tool, but it's not. It's more for refining the texture that's left behind from the punch. And the final vehicle is the flat chisel, the toothless, you know, just a flat blade tool. That's like walking, because you take away the smallest particles of stone with the flat chisel, um, but it's slow. So I can still remember when I started using these tools how much I liked the flat chisel because it engages in the tool and you can feel like you're working with purpose. You can feel, ah, that's exactly what I wanted to do. So a lot of times beginners, they say, ah, oh, the punch is too hard. I can't figure out how to get it to work the way I want it to. I'm not going to use it. But this one really works for me. I like it. The problem with that is this is like walking. So if you set out to go from New York City to San Francisco by walking, you're going to get to like Paramus, New Jersey and say, you know, this is fine. I think I'll stay here. <laughs> and it's the same way with your sculpture. If you set out to make a head and you start using the flat chisel, you'll compromise and you'll say, ah, oh, this is good enough. And your head will come out looking like SpongeBob. It'll still look like a block with maybe some details etched in the surface. So uh, that's my well-worn analogy of how these three tools work. And this one is just a hammer. This is, some hammers have the rectangular, but my teacher, Jose, he, he used this. So like so many things that I do, my idol did it. So that's, how, that's what I do. Right, we're going to take one final question, and then I'm sure Chris will be happy to answer many more of your questions in an informal setting. Hi, Chris. So Hi. it seems like with technology and all, really getting involved with the money is which is architecture. It seems like the, the direction is more artistic and sculptural. Is that how you're looking at it, or you know, how, how do you see the future for people that want to go into stone carving if everyone's hooking up a you know, CNC router to create all the geometrical elements? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say because you see, I, I mean, I'm seeing some sort of a groundswell of fascination with makers and making. Sadly, it seems to be kind of 3D printers is making, but I, I, don't, I don't understand that so, so much. But there seems to be uh, interest and fascination with making in the traditional way, too. We have so much, uh, you know, expectations maybe in the Industrial Revolution where, oh, it, machines are going to free us and we'll have all this free time and we'll just be standing around because we won't have to spend time 
with worrying about food and, and shelter because machines are going to take care of all that for us. But obviously, people are just as busy as they ever were. So I don't understand, but maybe, maybe we'll come to a point where it will be appreciated that the value of the objects is not so much in the final project product, but in, in at least to a great extent in the way it was produced. But you know, I'm a little bit of a hypocrite because you know, people can come to me and say, oh, this is artisanal chocolate. We, we hand selected the chocolate beans and we stirred them in the pot. And, and I'm like, I think the Hershey bar is fine. <laughs> I, I mean, it's not worth, it's, it, it's not worth the, $15 for the chocolate bar. So I, I think we, it, it's easy to say, no, I'm purist. I, it must be by hand. But I, I understand people who are not moved and are like, you know, that's fine for you. Uh, keep going with your stone thing. But, you know, I don't get it. I, I can't fault people for not getting it. But I, I'd like to, of course, be a voice for getting it. But, you know, everybody's into their own thing. And... Uh, I guess in conclusion, I don't want to not say this, we need help. <laughs> yeah. If anybody can help me connect to uh, clients or funding for the programs, please do so. If anybody's interested in learning, please contact me. Uh, I've mentioned throughout this program that, yeah, I, I teach classes and I, I'm really excited to share what I love and what I, what I know. Um, Throughout this program, I've, I've highlighted things where I thought, oh, when this gets out, you know, people are going to be like jumping up and down and going crazy. The people in the Institute of Classical Architecture, they, they awarded me this honor to be a craftsman of, of the year. And, uh, oh, boy, they'll, they'll have me up on the stage, and then everyone will know that I'm the guy to go to. The phone did not ring at all. So I'm aware that the product of what I have to offer is not sufficiently exciting, especially in New York City where there's beautiful stone carving all around us. It's not like I need to get out and expose the activity and have people be aware that, you know, it's not just the final product. It's actually, there's something going on more than that. The yeah, the process is also part of the beauty and sharing that is very important. <laughs> so... How did I do for my first lecture? <laughs>
of the artisans, and you'll come back many times. And to help facilitate that, we're giving you lifetime membership oh, wow. to the library. Beautiful. So. <laughs> Um, and then I'm going to ask uh, Lisa Wolf, our program coordinator. We, we always like to give a little memento of the evening. <laughs> and, and finally, just something to take everything away in a general society bag. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm proud, I'm proud to be a member. Thank you.